Hi everybody, my name is Matthew Pose of Pose Acoustics and I'm answering questions. So in this question I got, I don't know what this money is, it's 500 something, kind of looks like an R with some lines through it. Um, and, the, and the name of the channel it came from is Man Cave Audio. And, um, and then this individual asks a question that is not quite true. So we're gonna go ahead and address that. He says, hi, why Class D amplifier is not that much popular in HT? Have you ever tried Yamaha PX5 500 watt or PX3 300 watt power amp with eight ohms with inbuilt DSP with PEQ and many more? These amps are half of the price of other popular power amp. What are advantages and disadvantages of this Yamaha power amp in HD? Your thoughts and experience on the same. So first off, um, I'm guessing those are pro amps and I have not used that particular amplifier. We could look up on Google on the video, just try to read some specs off. But here, I just want to start by saying it is not true that Class D is not popular in home theater. The vast majority of high-end home theater amplifiers nowadays are actually Class D. One of the reasons why it wasn't popular for a long time was actually fidelity issues. So Class D amplifiers were often struggling from the fidelity standpoint because their distortion was too high, their noise was too high, their response was way too reactive, different loads caused a very different frequency response. And they just were not well-designed Class D amps. The other thing was that they really struggled sometimes, even though they had a power high power rating, they didn't necessarily deliver uh, that power in a usable way. So many of those amplifiers were not popular and people were sticking to their old, I'm gonna pick on Bryston, old Bryston class AB amps, which were solid, they worked, and, and you didn't have any of these issues to deal with. The problem with those class AB amps and even class H amplifiers, which use dual rails, is that they're not efficient. Now class H is more efficient than class AB, but the efficiency compared to good class D is still not similar. And so they produce a lot of heat, which you have to deal with somehow, and they also uh, tended to waste uh, potentially 50%, 60% of the wall power um, creating that amplifier power in the first place that you don't get to use as amplifier power. And as channel counts have increased where things like 16, 20, 32 channels has become the norm in the industry, um, the need for high density amplifiers where you've got a high channel count and a high power output in a relatively modest sized package has become critical. So with Trinov and Storm, all of their amplifiers are Class D, for instance. Morantz, so they came out with the AV10 and the Amp10. The Amp10 is all Class D. So yes, their older amps were Class AB, but they've come into the future, if you will, and they've gone to Class D. Um, there has been attempts to include Class D amplifiers into receivers over the years. So I think the better question here, the better answer to that part of the question is to say, one of the reasons why receivers continue to not use Class D amplifiers is cost. So Class D amplifiers of adequate performance cost more money than the Class AB amplifiers of the same performance. And it's gotten to a point now where using special power supply designs, excuse me, they're able to make these Class AB amplifiers efficiency not as high is class D, but high enough that they can continue to get the ratings they need to get and um, get the power output they need to get, but keeping the costs way lower. So NAD actually started to include the old Hypex UCD modules in their receivers, even though they're using the Encore modules and their higher end power amps. Why are they using UCD instead of Encore? Cost. Um, Pioneer had implemented some class D amplifiers that they designed for a while, and they were performing quite quite well, but the first generation had problems, the later generations were, were better, and then I believe they've now fully switched back to uh, Class AB amplifiers. Why? Well, there was the merger with Onkyo on the receiver development department, and then cost. Um, other companies have just not bothered. Why? I've talked to the engineers about why. They don't have a problem with it. They're not against it. It's that they can produce these Class AB amplifiers with good performance for way less money than they can produce the similar Class D amplifiers. So I expect that's going to change over time. But on the lower end equipment, yeah, we're still seeing a lot of Class AB, and it's just a cost issue. On higher end stuff, pretty much everything's switched over to Class D. That's pretty universal. Um, most of the high-end amplifiers that are going into receivers these days are Class D. I haven't done one of my higher-end uh, home theater projects with a Class AB amplifier in years. Everything I'm doing now is Class D. Everybody I work with uses Class D, and I've not seen anything else. Now, I mentioned that I was going to look at the specs on these, because I don't know, because he, he, the individual, Man Cave Audio, specifically says, what are the pros and cons of these amplifiers? So the PX5 is very likely Yamaha's own 
design for class D, <clears throat> and I don't know a lot about it, so let's see, here we go, what the specs are like. I mean, they're not that expensive. It appears to be that a PX5 is like 800 bucks or something. What I'm trying to find, and having trouble, is some sort of specifications for this thing besides just the basic power rating. All right, we're going to downloads. We got brochures and catalogs. We don't want that. We got manuals. Actually, let's try the brochures and catalogs and see if that at least gives us specs, because I don't want to go too far into this. No. All right, I'm going to try another website, because that didn't work. Sorry, guys. You know, I'm like all over the place with this. So I'm at Sweetwater's website now, because I'm hoping they might actually list the specs, since the other did not. All right. Oh, they don't list it. Let's just try searching for distortion. See if we can get a spec for distortion on it. So it says um, in the data sheet that it shall be less than 0.1% at 1 kilohertz, 10 watts, and 0.3% at 1 kilohertz half power. So I think that actually that tells, so less than 0.3% at half power. So if it's rated at like 500 watts, that's 250 watts, it's 0.3%. Well, I'll tell you what the trade-off right there then probably is. The fidelity of that amplifier is probably nowhere near that of a typical class AB amplifier. And it's probably not even in the ballpark of the best class D amplifiers that we're using. So the Purify amplifiers and the Hypex Encore amplifiers are gonna be not 0.3%, not 0.03%, they're going to be 0.003% or 0.0003%. Like, they're going to be way lower. In fact, I probably could look for the sweep right now of Hypex Encore. Let's see if we can do power sweep and just... All right, so... Oops, here we go. An NC252 uh, MP power sweep shows that it, it, this particular amplifier is a lower powered module. So this one at 8 ohms, it looks like it, it started to clip around 125 watts or so. So we'll just say that like 50 watts is its peak area, and that's actually where it's at its lowest distortion. And it's 0.003 or so. So 0.003 THD plus noise versus 0.3. So it's multiple magnitudes of order lower in distortion and noise than that Yamaha. So um, the trade-off with those amplifiers, which are coming from its cost, are just going to be that it's noisier and has higher distortion than what you can achieve. That's actually been one of the problems with these Pro Audio Class D amplifiers that often get used, is that their fidelity is not as good. Noise is often the biggest audible problem that I find with them. So I haven't used that amplifier, but we use a lot of PowerSoft amplifiers with the Gramani equipment, and PowerSoft is used with other stuff. We use speaker power and subwoofers a lot, um, RAM audio, and here's what I've noticed, especially with these higher efficiency speakers, there's audible hiss. So forget all the other fidelity issues that can be a little bit harder to hear, like the difference between 003% and 0.3% is probably audible, but it would take some careful listening to really hear the difference between that. It's not gonna like be right in your face obvious unless you really know what to listen for. Um, on the other hand, the hiss is going to be anybody walking into a room is going to hear that. And it's often a common complaint, and it takes a lot of work to fix it. And one of them is you can lower the gain and things like that. You can pad down the tweeter and then boost it back. If it's an active speaker, you can pad down the tweeter and then boost it back up in the amp so that you're operating in a lower noise area of the amplifier. But at the end of the day, those amplifiers are noisy. And if you just switched it out with like an Encore or a Purify amplifier, one of those very, very low noise amplifiers, you just wouldn't have that problem in the first place. So um, I'm not against them, but I mean, any notion that suggests that they're like the equal or better than even a receiver's Class AB amp, I think is misleading. They're more powerful, obviously. You know, 500 watts is a lot more power than the 120 watts or so you typically get out of a receiver. Uh, and that 
in some cases would be more valuable than the differences, the other differences, but they're noisier, they're higher in distortion. I haven't seen sweeps on these and I've never tested one of these Yamahas, but like on the old Behringers and the older Crowns and the older QSC amplifiers, if you did power sweeps at eight ohms and four ohms, what you would find is the frequency response changes. They uh, vary a, a good bit. Um, and so my guess is the Yamaha probably does to some extent as well. This has gotten way better as people have started to learn how to better handle feedback loops and where to place them so that they don't vary as much with impedance. So even like the Behringer stuff, their newest NX series, I think it's called, doesn't vary with, with the um, impedance very much. And so the response is better. The new newest best Texas Instruments um, chipset designs actually don't vary very much with frequency response, which is nice. And so the frequency response has improved dramatically with these Class D amps that can be used in the Pro stuff but it still isn't as good as what you're typically seeing from like Purify and Hypex and the, those types of, even Ice Edge. Ice Edge is actually quite good. And then there's also, um, oh goodness, now I can't remember the name of the other company. There's another one out there that's not as good, but not bad. Um, so anyway, as I said, first off, Class D is plenty popular with home theater and getting more so all the time. And second, in terms of like, probably more generally, the difference between something like this Yamaha amplifier, and this was actually related to the Truth Foci Audio V3 Mono Pono Power Amplifier. So comparing it to the Foci and the Yamaha, the Foci has way higher Sinad than that Yamaha is gonna have, like way, way higher. So much lower noise, much lower distortion. It's probably, I don't have test data to prove this, but it probably has less variance with impedance. And power-wise, it's not as powerful, but it also costs, what, like 100 and 40 bucks or something like that. Uh, so it's much cheaper um, than, than the uh, Yamaha. Doesn't have DSP, but in many cases, DSP can be brought in in other ways, including you can get a, a, a mini DSP flex. And uh, the mini DSP flex is also gonna be cleaner, lower noise and lower distortion than that Yamaha is while giving you all the DSP that you need. So I hope you found this helpful and uh, appreciate everybody watching. I appreciate the donations. Those are always really nice. Um, and uh, help to justify doing this. Please like and subscribe, that's really important. Uh, and I'll keep doing these videos best I can. And like I said, I, I think more and more it's getting to a point where I need to start thinking more critically about how I can start to do some training videos because I know a lot of you guys are asking about them. I will put out a little plug and I should probably do a separate video on this. I'm gonna be, of course I'm gonna be at Cedia. So um, I know I've missed a lot of other events because it's difficult for me to be able to um, get out as much as I'd like to, uh, given that I have project work and family re responsibility. Um, uh, but I will be at Cedia because that's really important for my job. And I will be uh, working with Anthony Gramani and we're gonna be working with JVC, it looks like this year. So we're gonna have a basic sound system. It's not gonna be over the top, but it's very, very good basic sound system. Hopefully dramatically improves the sound of the JVC room over past years with their excellent NZ900 projector. Um, I'll be working that room. I'll be around, please come say hi. I will also be teaching some classes. So I'm gonna teach the one day RP22. Adam Pels and I are each doing a different day of that. Same course, uh, we're actually working together to put it together. Um, and then I'm also gonna do a course, uh, I think I called it like Gain Ninja. So it's about learning to get good at working with gain basically in maximizing performance and minimizing noise issues in a system. It's a, I think it's a lost art in home audio. In pro audio, everybody understands gain. It's a critical part of how you set up a system and it's something that people get. Now, whether they always do it right, I don't know, but uh, certainly something people are used to hearing about. But in home audio, gain is typically fixed and most people don't really think about it because it is fixed, uh, but it actually matters. It's quite important. And with subwoofers, gain is not fixed, it's variable. And there's a lot of rules of thumb that are used that I think are not understood and are not always correct. So I'm, I'm gonna be teaching people how to do that. And when that is done, I will potentially do a video, I think probably over at Audioholics for Gene, on um, how to do the gain. Uh, basically a, a modification of the same thing. He has a great article that was written on it that I actually pulled from for my course. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate this and uh, keep on watching. I got more coming.